Hey everyone, welcome back. Today, I wanna to talk about something that really bothers me about the way that statistics is talked about in the news and media and pretty much all of the real world. And to do that, we're actually gonna to have to throw it back all the way to something you learned in elementary school, which is the average. So at some point during elementary school, you probably learned that if we do this thing called taking the average of a set of numbers, then we end up with a single number that in some sense is supposed to be representative of the entire population. So let's start with a similar example here. So let's say that you are a crazy college professor, this person right here, and let's say you teach statistics and you just learned about this fancy new teaching method. And you wanna see if it's any good. So you teach two lectures, lecture A and lecture B. So for the students in lecture A, you go with the traditional teaching method that you've been doing for years. And for the students in lecture B, you try out this fancy new teaching method. So let's say the course goes by, all the students take their final exams, all the students get the same final exam, of course, and you measure the scores on that final exam on a scale of zero to 100. So let's say the report comes back and you find that the average score for the students in lecture A was 70%, and the average score for the students in lecture B was also 70%. Based on that information alone, you might conclude that, well, these two teaching methods were equally good, there's nothing more to talk about here. And in fact, when you think about any statistic in the real world, almost any statistic in the real world you hear about on the news, or you read about in an article, for example, this is pretty much where they stop. For example, they'll say, on average this year, Americans have consumed this many pounds of meat per person relative to this many pounds last year. And that's supposed to tell you the entire story, supposedly. Now, I totally understand why this is done, because in terms of what the general population understands, averages are pretty well understood. But going beyond averages can get a little bit more confusing. But I truly think that if at least the notion of what comes in after an average, which we know is the standard deviation, if that notion was made more commonly talked about, we would all have much, much richer understandings of the full story. So let's start our story there, which is going beyond the average mu and talking about the standard deviation. So this shouldn't be too new for any of you, given you've studied some amount of statistics. So let's say that the distributions of scores for the students in lecture A look like this red plot here, and for the students in lecture B look like this blue plot here. Now, as promised, the average of both of these distributions is at 70, so this is true. But you can see the big difference here is in the spread, variance, or standard deviation of these two score distributions. The standard deviation, when we take that into account, is much wider for the students in lecture B who got the fancy new teaching method than the students in lecture A who got the traditional method. And that tells us about the uncertainty we have around this estimate of the average score. For example, if you saw this and you're taking the standard deviation into account, you might explain that by saying, hmm, well, students are probably used to traditional methods of teaching, and so whatever score they got probably doesn't have too much variation because there's no surprises in the education for them. However, when you expose students to this new method of teaching, perhaps on average they're doing the same as the old method, but some students really, really vibe with this method, do really well compared to the A method, and other students do really poorly. Maybe it's too surprising, maybe they're not used to it. And so thinking about the standard deviation in conjunction with the mean actually gives us more information to improve this lecture B method for the future. And this is where the video starts getting really interesting because I think even students of statistics will typically stop here. Maybe even in the real world, when you're in a job which requires analytics, you might say, here's the average of my metric and here's the standard deviation of my metric, and that's the end of the story. Let's go one step further. Let's go talk about skewness. And to do that, we're gonna assume that the distribution of scores looks a little bit different now. So let's pretend that the A distribution, so the lecture A scores, look like this red plot here, and the B distribution is kind of this mirror image, which looks like this B plot here. Mirror image if you reflect about this uh, line 70 here. So in this case, you can see that the average of the two scores is still the same, it's still 70. You can see that because these peaks are a little bit to the left and right of 70, so you can see that the average being kind of the center of mass of the distribution is 70 in both cases. You can also see by the fact that the distributions are mirror images of each other reflected among this 70 line that the standard deviations need to be the same. And that kind of brings up a limitation of the standard deviation overall. The standard deviation is symmetric. It doesn't care about whether the outliers of your distribution occur to the left or the right. 
It just cares about what is the absolute distance from those outliers to the mean. Therefore, we have a two distributions here, which visually look different and visually are telling very different stories. But if we were just reporting summary statistics, their averages would get reported as the same and their standard deviations would get reported as the same. The big metric that's different here, just visually, is that the blue distribution is skewed to the left, which means that it has this long tail to the left, while this red distribution is skewed to the right. It has this long tail that leads to the right. And therefore, the best additional metric to report in this case would be called skewness, which intuitively tells us about the asymmetry of a distribution. Is it skewed to the left, like B is, where there's a long tail of students who are doing really poorly and that we might care about? Or is it skewed to the right, where there's a long tail of students doing really, really well, which is great for them, but maybe not too much as a cause for concern? So the skewness can really help us answer where is the tail of the distribution going? Which way is the distribution skewed? And so when you measure skewness, if it has a long tail to the right, like A does, we call this positively skewed, so that's positive skewness, it's a plus sign. And if it has a long tail to the left, like distribution B, we call this negative skewness. These two distributions from the previous page, which were symmetric, have zero skewness. So simply looking at the sign and the magnitude of that skewness can give you an idea about how much is it skewed and in which direction is it skewed. So this is much better, this is much richer than just mu and sigma, but let's not stop there either. There's one more beyond this that we can talk about, which really helps when we talk about mu, sigma, skewness, and this fourth one really gives us an overall idea about what is going on in this distribution. These four summary statistics really give a lot of the story. And to talk about that, you guessed it, we're gonna assume that the distribution of scores yet again looked a little bit different. So let's assume they look like this. So here's the A distribution, looks very much like a normal distribution centered at 70. And here's the B distribution, which is very pointy and has fatter tails than the normal distribution. And to be more mathematically accurate about what I mean by fatter tails, you can see that the normal distribution asymptotically approaches zero faster on either side than this B distribution, which is asymptotically approaching zero slower. Therefore, its value is higher when you go further out than the normal distribution's value. So let's think about these two distributions. The averages are the same. They're both symmetric and centered at 70. The standard deviations are actually the same. That's a little bit difficult to see visually, but rest assured here that the standard deviation of both of these distributions is the same. The skewness is easy to see visually that it's zero because as we were talking about, zero skewness for symmetric distributions as we have here. So if this was the case, if this was the true distribution of scores for A and B, then we would report the means as the same, we'd report the standard deviations as the same, we'd report the skewnesses as the same. And so there needs to be some fourth metric, some fourth summary statistic that captures how fast the tails are approaching zero, the fatness of the tails, and that method is called kurtosis. This is one of my favorite summary stats in all of statistics, just because it's so interesting, but also intuitive in what it is trying to measure. The kurtosis tells us about the tailedness of a distribution. And let's dwell on that for just a second further. If a distribution has wider tails, as this blue distribution does, then that means that it's going to have relatively more outliers than a distribution with thinner tails, like this A distribution here. So for example, if you think about all the students who are doing really poorly, so maybe scores less than 50, then for the normal distribution, it's not too many, pretty much nobody. But for this B distribution, there is quite a few students in this outlier category who are doing a lot worse than most other students. And similar story for the other side too. There's a lot of students in this B distribution who are doing really well, who are doing outliers in the positive sense than this A distribution doing really well out here. So as a professor, this can give me an idea about, well, maybe in the B distribution, I have more probability mass around this mean. I have to think about these students who are doing really poorly compared to the students in lecture A. Why would some students be doing exceptionally well in this teaching method relative to A? So talking about the kurtosis lets me talk about the extent of the exceptional students, either in the negative sense or the positive sense. And typically when you talk about kurtosis in data science or stats, you're talking about a notion called excess kurtosis, and that measures the extra or additional kurtosis relative to a normal distribution. So the convention in data science is that normal distributions, like A here, have a kurtosis of zero, 
And anything with more kurtosis than the normal distribution is said to have positive excess kurtosis. So this B here would have positive excess kurtosis. And anything that has tails approach zero even faster than the normal distribution would have a excess kurtosis that's negative. And let me just throw a couple of terms out here since we're here talking about kurtosis. Distributions with negative kurtosis are said to be platycurtic. Kind of sounds like platypus, but platycurtic. And distributions with positive excess kurtosis, like our B distribution here, are called leptocurtic. So maybe you'll see these terms come up, just kind of cool words to know in general. And what I really wanted to argue in this video is that I think that if everybody was very familiar with not just averages, but standard deviations, that would totally be enough. I think that would be great because now you could have a conversation with anybody or the news could tell you a story. And if they just automatically included standard deviations on there as well, and everyone had a general idea about what that means, then we'd be able to have much richer conversations around the full story surrounding some topic. And I would also argue that if you are someone getting into data science or statistics, then I would argue you go two steps further and talk about the skewness and the kurtosis as well anytime you report summary statistics. So if you're doing some kind of economic research and trying to understand the spending patterns of Americans last year versus this year, then talking about the mean gives you some notion about generally are Americans spending more this year versus last year. Talking about the standard deviation gives you a notion of is there more variability this year versus last year. Talking about the skewness tells you are there some set of Americans who are spending a lot this year compared to last year. Are there some set of Americans spending a lot less this year than last year? Talking about the asymmetry last year versus this year. And finally, talking about the kurtosis tells you, are there outliers relative to last year? Are there some Americans who have decided to really spend a lot less or just are earning less and are able to spend less? Telling you some kind of problem in the population probably. And are there some Americans who are able to spend a lot more? Could be some story about economic growth, helping the middle class earn more, or maybe some story about billionaires just getting richer. Anyway, kurtosis would tell you about that. And so the last thing I would say in this video is that this is not the stopping point. So you can talk about means, standard deviations, skewness, kurtosis. And since we're here also in statistical terms, these are called moments. So you could do a whole video that would be more theoretical on just moments of a distribution. But the mean is related to the first moment, the standard deviation to the second, skewness to the third, kurtosis to the fourth. And you can keep going. Even these four don't technically tell the full story. We can come up with two distributions that have the same mean, standard deviation, skewness, and kurtosis, but still visually look really different. And so the fifth, sixth, and onward moments can tell you more information. But I'd say at that point, the important thing for data scientists is to look at the full distribution. So anytime you get a new set of data, I think the first thing you should do is just plot that full distribution and think about, hmm, what are some interesting features of this distribution? Are there multiple modes? Are there a lot of outliers? Does it have really fat tails relative to a normal distribution? Is it skewed to the left or right? Is there a lot of variance? And then report those summary statistics. So hopefully you learned about some stuff beyond just means and standard deviations in this video and got your gears turning about how you can apply this to your own projects or your work. So if you learned something in this video, please, please like and subscribe. Any comments, always welcome in the comments below and I'll see you next time.